All right, this one is a celiac thrombus. You can see there's uh, there are perfusion changes in the spleen as well. Patient came in with generalized abdominal pain. Uh, but look, the spleen is described as unremarkable. You can see it's pretty variegated in appearance. And the vascular, of course, says normal aorta and no aneurysm. So we got a 10 out of 10 for the actual report. And this patient came in with abdominal pain. CT was read as no acute findings, but there were no description of the celiac or the splenic abnormalities. And the patient returned after two asymptomatic weeks with a CT demonstrating a celiac thrombus. I think he had a thrombectomy. Yeah, he had a thrombectomy. And the patient has no persistent issues. So this one you would expect to be pretty low. You really do have to prove damages to uh, get money out of this system. And one thing that's probably apparent to everyone that I've noticed in doing this is, you know, you hear about these huge indemnities that patients are awarded and you think, oh, that lucky guy got all that money, right? If you're not informed. But once you go through enough of these, you realize you wouldn't trade places with any of these people. Uh, I don't ever look at the, uh, any of these things and think that any of these plaintiffs got away with something or was dramatically overpaid. Um, and this was the one guy for whom I don't really have a lot of sympathy. I mean, he really doesn't have persistent issues. But they gave this a chance of success of zero. They just thought the findings were, and that's the only case in this collection that had a chance of success of zero. And another one of those rare ones where we got the entire apportioned liability. So the estimated settlement was 200,000 and that's what we paid. Uh, the vascular surgeon opined that the error did not result in further damage to the spleen, probably true. Uh, the lawyer felt there was no chance to prevail on the liability issue that we were gonna take the whole hundred. But this I liked. Uh, we believe plaintiff has returned to baseline, but he reports postprandial pain, acid reflux, gum and tooth problems, malaise, weight loss, mood swings, depression, and sexual dysfunction from his celiac thrombosis. <laughs> so that was their effort to prove uh, their damages. Okay, glad to see these two, uh, that we're gonna make it to these two because it is definitely worth pointing out that we had two cases. So perhaps that doesn't make a trend, but it is noticeable. Corneal ectopic pregnancies. These are the ones that go south very quickly that result in uh, extensive hemorrhage. That's the first time I've done that today. I was really improved in my performance. Um, and so one of these was an ultrasound and one was actually an MR. But you can see there, you don't have the uh, rim of myometrium that you would uh, like to see there on the outside of that gestational sac. So this got a nine out of 10 for reporting, but basically says twin gestation intrauterine identified. So this patient came in, was treated for a missed AB with laparotomy and DNC, no documentation of the products of conception in the operative note, and came to the ER with a positive HCG uh, almost a year later, the ultrasound reported as intrauterine twin pregnancy. The final read concurred. The ultrasound was then later follow-up ultrasound with the same prelim and final results, and she was followed through the pregnancy. But the posterior uterine fundal rupture led to the demise of the mother and both feti on Christmas Eve. So not one you want to go to court with, certainly. Uh, the estimated verdict was 3 million, chance of success 51. Some of these lawyers uh, use uh, kind of uh, established standardized documents and they say, estimate the chance of success and it, it says in parentheses next to it, you may not write 50. So they're always asked to, they have to do 51 or 49. And so the ones that are really not sure, they, they only hedge it by one percentage point. Uh, the estimated settlement on this, just 500,000, which actually seems low to me and apparently did uh, to the others involved here because the indemnity ultimately was 975,000. Uh, New Mexico, by the way, I haven't mentioned them. 
they you might have noticed right they have a higher incidence we they had a higher uh, ratio of risk in fact the highest one that i think was real of 7.4 a large part of that is because they have laws in new mexico that allow you to change the venue for your malpractice trial so no matter where in new mexico a malpractice case occurs the plaintiff lawyers can request that the venue be shifted to any other part of New Mexico. So what do they do? They all say, we'd like our trial in Santa Fe, uh, where everyone is more liberal, more educated, and more willing to take the part of the beleaguered, impoverished plaintiff, which in many cases in New Mexico, they are. And so that ultimately tends to drive up the uh, jury awards and settlements in the state of New Mexico. And we actually thought it significant enough that we uh, stopped taking new business in New Mexico. And we have very few facilities that we still cover there. And it's mostly due to the MedMal risk there. Uh, so the plaintiffs are also seeking punitive damages, which usually has something to do uh, with the behavior of a radiologist or any of the doctors involved in the case, uh, suggesting that they were somehow unprofessional or actively seeking a poor outcome, it's unusual. But we were just uh, discussing up here at the podium earlier, the idea that, hey, can a radiologist ever be held personally responsible? And certainly if you are, uh, if you incur a jury award well above the uh, limits for your med mal policy, that is theoretically possible, I will tell you, I've never seen it happen. I've never seen it happen. And I asked one of the lawyers, I said, you know, people ask me frequently, they say, hey, I, I'm gonna retire because I don't wanna take med mal risk and I don't wanna have my own personal wealth put at risk. And the lawyer said, you know what, that's not gonna happen. Uh, it, it really is not the kind of thing he said he'd ever seen, but, if you are personally culpable due to some kind of misbehavior, that's when they might try to come after your personal wealth. And that would be situations like drunk at work, on drugs, right? Or uh, just nefariously, perniciously, actively seeking a poor outcome for your patient for whatever reason that might be. So they're pretty extreme examples. And I think most of us here, all of us here, should be put at ease with regard to that issue. Right? That it, uh, it takes serious, over-the-top kind of misbehavior to put you personally at risk in a med mal case. Uh, so this was nice. We had a radi the radiologist was well-groomed, pleasant, and knowledgeable. I had another one of these for one of these cases that said the radiologist was quirky and disheveled. So this is actually uh, much better. So watch for those corneal ectopics. They, they really can, as I said, go south quickly. And this is an incredible case. So this is the MR. Uh, so if you look at the report, non-dedicated exam, no gross complication seen in the patient's single intrauterine pregnancy. So this really wasn't done as a fetal MR, it was just a uh, generic kind of protocol for an abdominal MR. But do you see what this is? This patient has a bicornuate uterus and has a corneal ectopic in one horn of it. Uh, and of interest, there was actually a tiny stone in the proximal right ureter to which this patient's symptoms were attributed. But you can see the endometrium there of the other horn that doesn't have a pregnancy in it. All right, so dinged for structured reporting, hedging, and a lack of recommendations. This patient came in at 5 p.m., 22 weeks pregnant with 10 out of 10 abdominal pain. The MR was interpreted as no acute findings, but limited pregnancy evaluation. The final MR was read as a bicornuate uterus and a corneal pregnancy and a ureteral stone. The patient was discharged on amoxicillin and died in an ambulance returning to the ER the next day. 
So the estimated verdict here was 3 million, 75% chance of success, a portion liability of 20%, and an estimated settlement of 150,000. So we ended up paying 275,000 on that, but that is an interesting case. It's a that's a pretty scary one. I mean, that's a tough call I think to make, but right? Right? I think it's just that it was so far up in that horn uh, that there was uh, basically less myometrium to contain the thing and for the placenta to burrow into. Yeah, it's uh, it, that is just a tough case all around. Certainly people carry pregnancies to term all the time with a bicornuate uterus. So liability here, doubtful to non-existent. This was the patient who, uh, the plaintiff was told on two occasions she had an ectopic and that she faced possible death if it were not addressed. She had signed out twice as AMA, uh, and yet still. So interesting, the uh, referring surgeon was aware of the location of the pregnancy and still chose to discharge the patient, perhaps per Sushila's point. All right, we'll look at these uh, last two. These are both popliteal cases. It was interesting. There were actually three popliteal cases, three popliteal artery cases. One was an aneurysm uh, on ultrasound, and that was in our initial collection of five studies where the radiologist did nothing wrong. So the two where there was actually a diagnostic error are these two, and this is the tough one. This, there's a little dissection. You can see uh, a linear filling defect there in the popliteal. And then when you follow down into the leg vessels, they all dink, 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 just disappear from distal thromboembolism. Pretty subtle case, but all, all three of the leg vessels ultimately uh, were embolized and occluded. I think I did a mag view on it. There it is. So there's the dissection. Pretty short segment. And then you can see each one of these leg vessels just snuff out in turn. So there were the findings. Nine out of 10 on the report. It says left lower extremity pain and swelling. Uh, so it was dinged for not addressing the clinical concern. But that is a tough one. This patient, uh, presented to the ER with anterior foot numbness, came back with pain, diminished pulses and coolness. The CTA read as no acute findings. The final read the next day also failed to describe any dissection or clot. And then the next day, the patient came to the primary care provider with a cold blue left foot. Failed three days of TPA infusion and then had a thrombectomy and fasciotomy, ultimately progressed to a below knee amputation. So the estimated verdict here was 6 million, 40% chance of success, 30% of portion liability, and an estimated settlement of 800,000. We paid an indemnity of 975,000. So tough case, but definitely real findings and definitely a bad outcome. Uh, so this was a rural jurisdiction uh, white conservative and lower to mid-class. Such jurisdictions are often more defense friendly. The jury will likely relate more to the plaintiff who lives there as opposed to our client who is a Haitian immigrant living in Florida. I don't know who that's describing, but uh, opposing counsel has tried 32 medical malpractice jury trials in the last five years and has been first chair in all cases for the last 10 years. He obtained plaintiff verdicts in 29 of those trials. Wow. So two were declared mistrials due to hung juries and the plaintiffs did not pursue a second trial. Pretty impressive record though that I'm sure intimidated uh, our legal team. And in spite of the delay attributable to our client of being only 12 hours, uh, still in a case of limb ischemia that uh, apparently was enough to carry the day.